So this talk is going to be partially about you know, what it means to, to democratize access to the centralized web. We, we say that this is our mission uh, at, at MetaMask. We want you know, millions and then, and then billions of people to have access to the, to the new forms of social coordination that the decentralized web represents. Um, but you know, this will be partially a, about us and, and what we believe in, uh, but partially also about what I believe our ecosystem itself should uh, represent and, and fight for. Um, we apparently don't know what these. Okay, great. Um, so look, it, it's no surprise that web, and especially for this audience, that web two um, sucks. So I I grew up at a time when the internet meant BitTorrent and uh, information wants to be free, and uh, we were going to make a, a a radically more empowering society. Um, through the web, and instead we got, uh, you know, like four companies run our lives, and uh, we're their products. And and why did this happen? It's because there there wasn't a native business model for the internet in the early days. The the web itself was, you know, largely structured in a way where you could build great things, like you could make a social network, you could make a video streaming platform, you could do really really powerful things, but there was no way to monetize this. So um, you know, the the basic inherent business model became surveillance capitalism, um, and it uh, built platforms that are constantly hacked. That are that are manipulating us, making us addicted, making us hate each other, um, and we hate these platforms even though we use them. So um, I want to talk to you about uh, you know for for us and MetaMask and and where we see ourselves in this. Um, you know, we create and provide a consensual transactional layer for the web. So this is a permission system. Web3 is, it's not just the protocol. Like the, the Ethereum protocol is, is a core and central piece of that, but it's also the interaction between the, the user and the communities that they want to join, the sites that they want to interact with. So we're, we're both, you know, uh, we're, we're a secure, um, easy to use Ethereum wallet, but we're also a set of client-side APIs that allow you to interact with the decentralized web. That allow you know we're you know we're providing agency to you. We're providing um, more consensual interactions so that you can you can understand the things that you're doing, why you're doing them, um, and and you know the Web three uh, values are central to to like what we do, um, both you know. Um, you know, I, I don't think I have to explain any of these to this to this audience, but um, and we we want to be the most interoperable and universal wallet. And I'll talk about why that's so important and why extensibility and universality are central to creating um, great Web three experiences. They're really important to the decentralization of our ecosystem. And yeah, let's talk about that. So um, this is. I'll start with some basics. These are some some basic principles for the interaction between the wallet and the decentralized web. Um, the person has to own their own accounts. They have to the interface and how they interact with um, uh, with, with decentralized applications. It has to be accessible to most people. And today we made huge headways in that direction, but. Uh, this is, you know, it's an, it's an ongoing and iterative process. The requests that people consent or that, that people are being asked to do, they have to be clear. It can't be like Web2 where you got a checkbox and you consented to giving away everything in your entire life um, to Facebook or, or whatever, whatever major Web2 company. Um, the, uh, the, what you consent to also has to be done progressively. Like it should be the minimum amount of, uh, of of consent required to complete an action is what you should give, and nothing more. And if more is needed later, that happens progressively. Um, and then everything that you have have granted permissions to has to be revocable at the protocol layer, at the wallet layer. Um, the, those are those are core principles. Uh, so let's talk about what meaningful decentralization in the wallet space means and, and why it's really important. So there's, there's basically three components. There's permissionless key management, there's the permissionless APIs, 
and then there's progressive community ownership. And so I'm going to talk about each of these. Um, so when it comes to key management, uh, the most basic thing is no one should ever be able to deny you access to your funds. Um, the key management strategy that you choose, and you know, in our vision today, we provide access to software wallets. We let you connect your hardware wallet and cr create a, uh, a layer, you know, the API layer between a hardware wallet and any decentralized application. So you can, you can keep your funds securely in a hardware wallet without having them on your device if you think your device might be compromised. But, but also other types of key management strategies are gonna be a part of the vision of MetaMask and letting people choose whatever it is that they want to do and how they wanna manage their funds. So that includes things like uh, multi-sigs. So you know, like bring a Gnosis safe into MetaMask, connect a custodial account if you want to, shard your keys, all of those things, like no wallet should be able to deny someone access to their funds and you know, the user should be able to decide how they want to manage their keys in the way that makes sense for them. Okay, let's talk about the second principle here. Permissionless Web3 APIs. And when we talk about Web3 APIs, there's basically two things that really matter. One is they have to be permissionless. They have to not be like, uh, you know, like some, some people in the space, like especially Web2 people, when they come in, they think that they want either um, a bunch of integrations rammed into a wallet, or they think that they want a wallet embedded in a Web2 app. Both of these create a form of a walled garden. Um, they're super opinionated. They can't innovate at the pace of a decentralized ecosystem. And instead, you know, so what, what we provide is these permissionless client-side APIs. We can't, they're, they exist on your device. We have no access to them. We don't charge to use them. It's impossible for us to do so even if we wanted to. And these create interactions between the dApp uh, and the user in a permissionless way. And then the second aspect of this is that they have to be maximally extensible. So th this means um, you know, what you can build has, is, is greatly defined by how extensible those APIs are, how diverse those APIs are, what they can do. Um, so, so this is for everything from how you connect to a dApp, uh, how you can connect to or add any node service. So like we provide a, a, a custom network API. This is uh, an API that allows dApps to, to suggest a custom network, to suggest a custom node service. Um, and you can do a, a great number of other interactions that are a little bit lesser known and that I'm gonna talk about in a second. And then, um, you know, uh, we're also taking extensibility to the next level by allowing other people to develop features for the wallet um, in MetaMask Snaps, which I'm gonna talk about in a second. Uh, but so progressive community ownership is the third principle here. And that means that increasingly these things should be owned by the people who use them. Um, that's always been a core principle of MetaMask. Um, Making a client-side piece of software meaningfully owned by its community is a super hard problem, um, uh, and it, it it's more complex than airdropping a token. Um, although, like, you know, I, I'm, I'm sure people want to ask about that. Uh, <laughs> um, all right, but so everything should be just fucking amazing, right? Well, no. Um, uh, so, like. A lot of our ecosystem is, is not like really what we would be proud of. Um, I like to make fun of Pixelmon because it's hilarious. Um, like Kevin, Kevin from Pixelmon is, is now like my, my symbol of, of funny cash grabs. But you know, our ecosystem has gone through a number of cycles where the things that are being built are either walled gardens, so you're making like a web two app with like a, a sucky token scheme on top of it or like a, a, you know, like a game that's siloed, or um, you know, I've, I've seen so many stories of these. Like, part of the, what's valuable about our ecosystem is the interoperability uh, between things, and I'm gonna say more about that in a minute, but um, you know, we, we have to be better than these things. Um, we have to not, like, like DeFi 2.0 was, uh, you know, like not, not really the most amazing thing. Like a lot of people didn't understand the mechanisms and they were being hyperinflated away and just losing tremendous amounts of money to whales. Like, I don't want to make a casino. I want to make an internet that, you know, changes the world and makes, uh, you know, allows people to build communities and allows people 
to, to freely interact with each other. Uh, scams, rug pulls, these are becoming more and more commonplace. And as the ecosystem grows and as more diverse communities enter the ecosystem, the risk of phishing is, it, it grows quite, quite significantly. Um, and, and so, you know, all of us have a, a responsibility as an ecosystem and in the wallet space especially has a responsibility to keep people safe. Um, and, you know, like we're also seeing like these centralized chains that don't share, share the, the values of the early ecosystem growing quite tremendously. Um, and certainly like decentralization will be a spectrum, but uh, we also have to understand the systemic risk that um, people are, are um, taking without realizing that they're taking it. Okay, so how do we make a sustainable, regenerative, decentralized web that we can all be proud of? Um, that, that's what I want to build. So a few things. Um, Web3 offers models of community ownership. Like we all know the story of Uniswap, retroactive airdrop, um, and this became like a really, really popular thing where it became really clear that over time, these platforms and protocols that we're building can be owned by the people who participate in those systems. Uh, but since then, we've also seen that airdrop farmers, civil attacks, they make it super hard to do that in a way that it's not like, oh, let's, let's airdrop a token to the five VCs that Sybil attacked our contracts. Um, that's, that's not decentralization. That's, you know, and, and it might benefit the teams who do it because they get some allocation of tokens, but that's not decentralization. Um, we, we need another layer of things to make these be able to happen in ways that are meaningful. So social graphs, attestations, like it has to be super clear what someone says, that, or who someone says they are, who do my, or what do my friends say something is, and also uh, what, um, you know, what, what are, um, what, what is my opinion of what that is? And, you know, this comes down to things like how we list tokens and protect people from scam tokens or spam tokens, and how do we, um, you know, how do we discover what is the canonical source of an NFT? All, all of those sort of things are really important for the basic wallet interactions, but they're also super important for figuring out the next, uh, the next wave of things with, um, you know, like how we distribute ownership, who are unique humans. Um, and, so, and, and then what we build has to be interoperable. It, like the value of our platforms is that these NFTs or these tokens, they can move across, um, across dApps. They can't be siloed to a single dApp that when you, when you start siloing that, you just have web two with a Satir database. Okay, we gotta make thing, start by making things that people will love. And it's no coincidence that my favorite dApps, they're not financial dApps. Um, you know, so I'll do like a, a call out like Dark Forest. Like if you join their Discord and you're like, how do I make money in this game? Their answer is, well, you don't, it's just fun. Um, and, and it's like, it's actually the best blockchain game. Um, I don't think, uh, I don't know, maybe, maybe this is a controversial statement, but uh, uh, <laughs> um, skiff.org, uh, you know, if, if, you, if you haven't heard of this, this is, uh, you know, it's a, it's a Web3 Google Docs where you use your Ethereum address to share documents. It uses the encrypt decrypt API in MetaMask to, to encrypt and secure documents. So it's actually one of the lesser known APIs that can be used to build all kinds of things. Um, it's also used to build um, the centralized social networks and things like that. Um, we've got to build utility first. Um, social graphs, I talked a little bit about this already. Um, shout out to, to some people that are, are doing really great work on social graphs, uh, which, which I think are going to be really important to the identity solutions uh, for the space. Sprightly is a, a especially important one. Um, Lens Protocols is pretty cool. Um, I'm going to try to go quickly so we have time for a question or two. Uh, we want to build for extensibility um, and build for interoperability. So, you know, the uh, I have over there the, the Power Rangers. There is like one of the very first DAO mergers that ever happened, uh, where this was done through a permissionless token swap. And be because people had built for interoperability, and because they built in a Web three way, it was possible to do this in a way that never would have been possible through like siloed Web two apps or something like that. Um, 
we, uh, we provide a number of client-side APIs, so the most commonly known things are transactions, but we also provide signatures and encrypt decrypt, so you can, um, uh, you can sign things, you can vote, you can, uh, you can sign into platforms, uh, and encrypt decrypt, you can decrypt documents like I was talking about before. But so let's talk lastly about MetaMask snaps. So MetaMask snaps greatly increases the extensibility of the wallet layer by allowing the DAP to uh, prompt you to add additional features to your wallet. And these can be developed by third parties. So these are, these are sandbox JavaScript apps. They use secure ECMAScript as a hardened version of JavaScript. And uh, so, so you can go and try this out today. It's inside of MetaMask Flask, which is uh, kind of a developer beta build of MetaMask. It's in, it's in the Chrome store. Um, and you can prompt the user to add a custom blockchain. So like you can install Bitcoin. There's uh, teams building Solana snaps. There's um, people building uh, ZK rollup snaps. Uh, no wallet team can be the best team at every protocol. Um, this isn't a, a services relationship. We want to build empower an entire community of builders to, to build the wallet of the future, um, whether that be other blockchains, custom account types, like import your Gnosis safe, uh, subscribe to a notification service from your DAP. Uh, there's like a dozen of them now. Uh, it, it's really all about increasing the extensibility and permissionlessness of the wallet space. Um, yeah. And I don't know how much time I have left, but I will take a question or two if I have a So, uh, so I want to just be super clear about one thing. We don't, um, we don't currently have any plan to launch like a Snap store, um, like like an App Store does. These are actually permissionless client side things. Now, we we may have certain things that are like audited, and we may tell you like, oh, this Snap has been audited, and you can feel safer with your funds in it than like a rando Snap that you, but. But the basic interaction is like you arrive at a site in the same way that the site prompts you to connect today, it prompts you to install the snap um, and you can see like what permissions it has access to. It's, it's also like um, it, it has a different set of keys which um, are derived from your secret recovery phrase but it never gets access to your secret recovery phrase. Uh, and eventually it'll even be possible to sandbox that key away from the snap where the snap can't see its own key. But, um, so I, you know, I think that what the most meaningful metrics of decentralization in the space are um, the extensibility and permissionlessness of the wallet, in my opinion. Um, I do think that the wallet space is also super competitive. Like there's dozens of wallets, or a lot of them, and it gets more competitive every day. So, um, you know, like we'll we'll keep building in the way that we think um, you know represents our values and. And try to enable more people. Uh, any other questions? Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, so this is already live in MetaMask Flask, which is the the beta build. So you can start building snaps today. Uh, the snap system we plan to launch in production this year. Um, yep. But uh, if you're interested in building snaps, like do that now. Uh, yes. Would it uh, tell me what do you mean by that? Um, well, like there's there's a lot of super hard problems um, in the extensibility space. So like, you know, like how do we, you know, deal with things like rogue snaps or like how do you deal with uh, you know competing 
teams that are building snaps for the same protocol, for example, like if I have one Bitcoin snap and one Ethereum snap. So, like, so there's some super hard UX problems. Um, and then there's also like, I guess the other aspect of the problem space is around platform risk, like from web two companies, like saying like, oh, this, you know, a lot of like, uh, you know, a, a lot of uh, um, stores, like app stores and stuff like that, um, have really blurry lines around extensibility and it's, it's hard to, um, to be compliant uh, with them and not be deplatformed. But, uh, you know, we've, we've actually, like, a lot of the hardest work that we've done on this is on figuring out how we can be maximally compliant or maximally compliant while maximally decentralized and extensible at the same time. Well, uh, yes. Yeah, we, we want snaps to be an open standard that other wallets can adopt to. So um, it needs to be a little bit more stable before we're ready to do something like that. Because it, like, we're today, like, if you're building on Flask, there's definitely going to be breaking changes in the APIs. And it's not really ready to be adopted as, like, a, a mass standard for the wallet space. But yeah, like, we, we do want to contribute to the ecosystem as a whole. And we don't want to be gatekeepers or something. Well, thank you all so much. Um.